Welcome colleagues to the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here. My name is Peter Lowen. I'm a professor of political science, global affairs and public policy, and I'm the associate director for global engagement at the Monk School. Um, this is the last talk in our series on making sense of the, of the uh, 2020 US election, um, though we could use more talks, I suspect, to continue to make sense of it. Um, but we're really finishing on a, on a, on a real high note uh, in this series. We're joined today by Lynn, Lynn Vavrick from uh, UCLA. I'll introduce Lynn in a moment. Um, before I do that, I do want to acknowledge that the land on which the University of Toronto operates has for thousands of years been the land to, uh, to Indigenous peoples, the Huron Wendant, uh, the Senecas, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Um, and today, uh, these people continue to work across Turtle Island and we continue to be guests on their land and we're grateful for this opportunity to live and work uh, in this beautiful place. Um, Lynn Vavrick is a, is, a, is a wonderful guest for us to have at, at the university uh, and to talk to us about the 2020 election. She is formerly the, the Marvin uh, Hoffenberg Professor of American Politics and Public Policy at the University of California, Los Angeles, a contributing columnist to the Upshot at the New York Times and a recipient of the Andrew F. Carnegie Prize in the Humanities and Social Sciences. What's most amazing about Lynn to me is that she is the, the most prolific real-time political scientist analyzing elections today with her colleague John Sides and with other colleagues. She has for the last number of elections effectively written books uh, accounting for elections in, in near real time, which is a hard thing to do um, with rigor. In this election, she's been doing an amazing project called Nationscape. It's the largest ever study of a presidential election field in the United States. The project interviewed more than 6,000 people a week and uh, that's uh, totaled up to more than 500,000 interviews before inauguration. Um, just, uh, just last week. So we don't have anyone who has as much data and, and as many lines of sight into US politics. Um, Lynn's gonna talk about pandemic politics, uh, interaction between COVID and the uh, US presidential election. And it's my pleasure, Lynn, to get out of the way and to give you the floor. Thank you so much, Peter. And thanks everyone for tuning in today. Um, I am gonna share my screen with you so I can show you some of the things that I have been working on. Uh, in real time, as Peter said, um, as I try to make sense of what happened in the 2020 election. And so um, the big news is that the incumbent president was fired, uh, a phrase that he likes uh, liked to use from his time on his television show, The Apprentice. So um, in this particular case, he's not firing people. He was fired by the American people. And so today I'm gonna engage this question. You know, how does this unpopular, twice impeached president, incumbent president, who's struggling to deal with the global pandemic, how does he come within 55,000 votes of reelection? This removal of an incumbent president after only one term in office is an unusual thing in the United States. And so we wanna think a little bit about how that unusual thing happened, but also how he comes so close to winning. So both of those questions are going to animate what I'm gonna show you here in the next um, half hour or so, and then we'll do some questions. Okay, so to understand the 2020 election, I'm gonna talk primarily about two things today, the economy and then COVID and the economy. Those two things are linked together in my mind. Um, and we wanna think about how COVID really changed the shape of the economy and how voters were thinking about it. So as Peter mentioned, a lot of the data that I'm going to show you today comes from my project called Nationscape, um, a large survey that I'm running with my UCLA colleague, Chris Tosanovich. And we have interviewed um, more than 500,000 people over the course of 18 months. So we started in July of 2019 and we literally fielded an emergency last wave after the um, attack on the Capitol. So we just came out of the field about 10 days ago. So this is a lot of data. It allows us to do comparisons across time and across space, across geography. We have uh, not really dug into the geography component yet in terms of COVID. I have a little bit of that I'll show you, um, but I'll talk a lot about uh, the time component. So the other project from which I'm going to draw um, data to talk to, to talk to you about COVID 
is a second project that I started in March when the pandemic began um, called the UCLA COVID Health and Politics Study. And this is a collaboration with professors in UCLA's David Geffen School of Medicine. And um, we have interviewed 70,000 people to date and we have about um, probably about 50 to, yeah, probably about 50,000 more to go. We have three more waves of this project. Each wave is 15,000 people. And um, we have research collaborations going on this project with the CDC, and we're really interested in helping them understand how to message uh, to increase vaccine update, uptake. So I'll tell you a little bit about that work too. So those are the two projects from which a lot of the data for today is going to be drawn. But we'll start with some basics. And some of this, given the set of people who have already come to you in this series, this may be a review for some of you, which is good. I always find that um, in, my, in my courses, you really can't uh, show things often enough. People then get really familiar with it. So hopefully this is familiar to all of you. But this is just I want you to appreciate the role that the nation's economy plays in presidential election outcomes in the US. So what I'm showing you here on the horizontal axis is the growth rate in terms of GDP. So is the economy in the first six months of an election year growing or is it shrinking or staying the same? On the Y axis, on the vertical axis here, I've got the incumbent party's share of the two party vote. And then the plotting symbols are the election years. And I've drawn just a best fit line through these plotting symbols. And you can see that line slopes up pretty dramatically. What does that tell us? That tells us that when the economy is growing, incumbent parties do well. So incumbent parties running in growing economies typically win elections. Incumbent parties in shrinking economies typically lose elections. So you want to be running in a good economy and you don't even have to be the actual incumbent person, just the party, the party of the incumbent. So you can see here that I've got 2020 highlighted for you. It is since the New Deal, since, you know, the 19, uh, I think 1948 might be our earliest election on here, maybe 52. Um, so since the New Deal, basically 2020 is one of the worst elections in terms of GDP growth that we have experienced. It's right down here with 1980. That's the re-election contest for Jimmy Carter. And Carter loses that election famously to Ronald Reagan. So um, 2020 and 1980 in terms of GDP growth. So this sets up the 2020 general election to be one that Trump should be struggling to win. Now, before COVID, before March, if we just said, what if COVID hadn't been? This number wouldn't be negative two. It'd be more, it'd be more up in this range, be one and change if, if we took quarter four and quarter one instead of quarter one and quarter two. And so that would have put Trump really close to the 50-50 line. So it's kind of similar to what it was in 2016, maybe slightly below, because he's, he's less popular. So even without COVID, this election was going to be highly contested. All right, but with COVID, it is one of the worst contexts we've ever seen. But the problem is that COVID complicates the economy for the country. And that happens because as you can see over here on the right-hand side, now I'm showing you on the horizontal axis, a different measure of economic context, change in real disposable income over the first six months of the election year. And now 2020 is literally the best election that we've got in the US in terms of RDI. Usually these things go together. GDP and RDI. Here's 1980, our low GDP election is also a low RDI election. Here's global financial crisis, 2008. No growth and then no increase in RDI. But 2020 is really unusual. It's our worst GDP election. It's our best RDI election. And that is because of the stimulus payments from government directly to Americans' pocketbooks. So because of that stimulus, because of COVID, 
in terms of RDI, 2020 looks like a good context. So this is going to complicate the economic context just a little bit. Now, the other thing that goes into the landscape or the context of elections is the president's approval rating. And as I think everyone knows, Trump's approval rating is chronically low. And so what I'm showing you here, the red line is always Trump's approval rating. This is all first term for all these presidents. I'm comparing it to presidents since Eisenhower. And there are just a couple of patterns here to keep in mind as we go through the rest of the talk. First. Trump is unpopular relative to all of these presidents. He is also more consistently unpopular. His rating changes very li little. There's low volatility in his rating relative to some of these others. We used to talk about presidents starting off with a honeymoon period. Okay, here's Carter, start, starts popular, becomes less popular. Here's Bush, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, starts popular, becomes less popular. Uh, George W. Bush, same story. These are all reflections of events that are happening during these presidents' tenure in office. Trump's approval rating is responding less well to events. So there's less volatility and he's very unpopular. Okay. So that's the landscape coming into this election. Now, there's one thing that is important in terms of things Trump can control that also limits his popularity. And that's the choices he made about what kinds of policies to pursue. So his agenda as president is not an expansive agenda. It's one that is really um, aimed at his base. And so what I'm showing you here are some policies that are being debated, currently actively debated. And I've got on the vertical axis, the net favorability of these policies among Republicans, that is, do they want these policies enacted into legislation? And then on the horizontal axis, the net favorability among all Americans. So let's just take a minute to say, if you're a candidate running for office, you got to win more votes than your opponent. You got to win more votes than your opponent. How are you going to do it? You're going to take steps to do things that more people want than your opponent does. So in some sense, candidates are always looking to add to their reelection votes. If they want to grow their base of support, not they certainly don't want to shrink it. And sometimes just maintaining it isn't enough. Now, if you're Donald Trump, you ran in 2016, you won that election in the Electoral College by 77,000 votes across three states. If you are that candidate, you should not be just trying to maintain that margin. You need to grow the margin. But what Trump does, you can see here, is he focuses on policies like the Muslim travel ban, repealing the ACA, building a border wall. These are policies that he is enacting that are very popular among Republicans. Okay, so Republicans, are, that's why they're gonna stick with him. He's doing things that are, is, that are popular among Republicans that are not popular among all Americans. So he's really shoring up the votes of his base, but not growing at all. And it's a missed opportunity because look what's over here. This quadrant that I've populated for you includes things that are massively popular with Republicans, right? That's why they're on the top, but also massively popular among all Americans. That's why they're on the right-hand side. This is the quadrant where Trump should have been living. Infrastructure, middle-class tax cut, increasing defense spending, Okay, $15 minimum wage is actually up in here. Universal gun background checks is up in here. Okay, he is not doing these things. He's focusing on things that are just popular among Republicans. So the takeaway here is he missed a huge chance to grow his base. And that's gonna be one of the reasons why he comes close to winning in 2020, but can't win again.
Okay, so now let's talk specifically about COVID. How does COVID play into all of this or change all of this? And it's really gonna, I think, ch mostly change things. So what I'm showing you here is just a sense of how much COVID changed everyone's life. And if we focus on these dark bars, these are precautions that people have taken because of COVID very early in the pandemic. So um, this goes through about May, March to May. Have you canceled travel, not left home for prolonged periods, stopped visiting your family and friends, worn a mask, washed your hands more often? And this is just a massively large share of the American electorate saying that they have changed their lives in these fundamental ways. These lighter gray bars, we've asked people when they would be ready to return to doing these things, conditional on the thing being something they would have done before. So when are you going to be ready to go back to a stadium concert or a sporting event? Very few people willing to do these activities that I call activities you do with strangers. You don't know who else is gonna be there. Things where you kind of know who might be there, uh, send your kid to school, go to a wedding reception, go to church. You kind of know those things. Those are a little higher. And then things like going to a funeral, getting a haircut, going to the dentist, going to dinner at a friend's house are the things that people are most willing to go back to doing uh, once it's been deemed to be safe. That was part of the question. Would you go back and do these things if the CDC said it was safe to do so? Now, what this shows, people have a real hesitancy to get back to things. Um, so COVID, has, it, people are afraid, they are concerned about the disease. It's changing everyone's life. Here's another way to see that broken out by political party. The blue line for Democrats, the red line for Republicans, the yellow for independents. And just over time here again, very early in the pandemic, before the election is heating up, um, have you canceled travel, stayed at home, stopped visiting family, washed your hands? And I've ordered them in the increasing order of incidents, but I also want you to see, you hear a lot about the partisan separation on these things in the United States, that Republicans are less willing to take precautions than Democrats, they don't take it as seriously. But what I want you to see here is these numbers are big, even, even among Republicans, seven out of 10 people, nine out of 10 people washing their hands more frequently. So yes, there's a, there's a gap here, but the baseline rates for everybody are very high. So in an article that um, my co-authors, John Sides and Chris Tisanovich and I published in the Harvard Data Science Review, we tried to make this argument that that political separation that I just showed you is, is not natural. It, it isn't just that, people who tend to be Republicans also tend to be people who don't worry about things, are not cautious. This is caused, this difference, partisan difference is caused by elite rhetoric. So I'm gonna show you some of those pictures um, and how we're thinking about this. So I've got two columns for you here, um, the same things in, uh, in across the rows. So. On the left-hand side, I'm showing you differences drawn by political party. Blue Dems, red Republicans, the black line is the average. And then on the right-hand column, I'm breaking it out geographically by early peak states, that's gonna be like your New York, your East Coast, late peak states, that's the orange line, that's gonna be your Midwest, and then states that really never had a surge. Um, and those are going to be the gray lines. And here's just concern about coronavirus. You can see in the very beginning of the pandemic, there was very little separation by political party. Everyone is concerned. As we move through time, the party separation starts to happen. The same thing is not happening across geography. People in high peak states ought to be more concerned than people in low peak states in the beginning. In the middle, those later peak states ought to be more concerned than the low rate states, but you don't see any of those differences emerging. And the same thing with support for all of these mitigation strategies, approve of canceling large gatherings, 
Partisan differences start in May, no geographic differences. Restricting non-essential travel, partisan differences, no geography, and approve of closing schools and universities. So something is happening to partisans that is not tied to the objective conditions of the virus where they live, which is how they're gonna get the disease, right? Where, where you live. Those differences are tied to party even within the infectious rates in states. So now I'm showing you those same four things, but broken out in column one, these are just the early peak states. In column two, the later peak states, and in column three, the states that never really peaked. And you can see across all of those different virus infection levels, those partisan differences emerge. Okay, so we're making the argument here that these differences are being driven by elite rhetoric, particularly uh, Donald Trump saying that there's nothing to worry about, um, we've got it under control, it's gonna be gone in 100 days, blue state governors are trying to kill your economy and um, politicizing, tying the virus to uh, the motives of politicians. Now, Americans respond to these COVID mitigation strategies like the ones I just showed you, canceling uh, travel, uh, making us you know, do school from home. They rally behind their governors, but not behind Trump. So this is the change in approval rating from the fourth quarter of 2019 to the end of the third quarter of 2020. So after the, um, the, uh, the pandemic has begun and the mitigation strategies have gone in place. And you can see Trump's approval rating changes only by four points. Ron DeSantis in Florida, one point. But the rest of these governors, here's uh, Gretchen Whitmer. She's the governor of Michigan. And she is going to be one that Trump is gonna pick on as trying to hurt the economy. Her approval rating because of her reaction to COVID goes up 21 points in a quarter, okay? And so you can see these governors are getting a real boost that Trump really never gets. In terms of this question, do you approve of the way they're handling their job? Okay, so this is a hit for Trump. So this is our second indication that something that was within his control is a missed opportunity. He missed the opportunity to enact those massively popular policies. And he's missing the opportunity to provide relief to people um, uh, for COVID. Now, all of these political actors approval ratings about COVID are gonna start high and fall. So what I'm showing you here is from July of 2019, well before COVID until just last week when we came out of the field, I've got Trump's job approval rating. So do you approve of the way he's doing his job as president? Do you the, approve of the way he's handling COVID is this green line? And then do you approve of the way your governor is handling COVID? Do you approve of the way your city and county officials, local officials are handling COVID? All of these actors in the crazy US federalism design have a say in how we live our lives. So uh, county and city, state, and then national government. As you may know, Trump left a lot of the mitigation to the state and the county and city leaders. People like that those people are trying to solve their COVID problems. These ratings in terms of level are much higher than Trump's rating for handling COVID. They decline at the same rate, but the level I think is instructive. This is a missed opportunity by Donald Trump to solve people's problems. Let's go back to COVID concern. Again, broken out by political party over the span of our data. March, when we started asking about it on a fluke, we thought, you know, we should ask some questions about this thing. Um, and we thought we'd leave them on for a couple of weeks. We never took them off the survey. So still asking them up until last week. Democrats always concern. Independents are the green line and Republicans the red. 
And you can see those lines show more trend. And I've put some dashed vertical markers in here for the timeline. So this is Trump's first speech where he declares a national emergency. And you can see concern about COVID among independents and Republicans shoots up. Democrats are always concerned. Then here, a couple of weeks later, he starts picking on Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan. He says, liberate Michigan, go down to the Capitol and protest and tell the governor to, to free you and open the businesses. This is about the time when people are getting pressured, governors are getting pressured to allow their businesses to reopen by Trump. The scientific community is still saying, we don't have a hold on this. But the president and his administration are saying, we need to reopen businesses and save the economy. Independents and Republicans concern about COVID plummets. Okay, I don't wanna, that's, that's an overstatement. Still seven out of 10 people are concerned about the disease. So we don't, we, I don't mean to say that they're not concerned. They are much less concerned than they were at the beginning and less concerned than Democrats. Then summer starts. Here's June 4th, the beginning of summer after Memorial Day weekend in the United States. And there's a lot of news about how summer people are gonna start having parties and wanting to go outside and go to the beaches and uh, concern goes up a little bit. Then we have our political conventions where Trump delivers the message that this is under control, we're winning the war on COVID and concern kind of goes back down. So this is all to say that among independents and Republicans, concern about COVID does in some way seem to be tracking the rhetoric that Trump is delivering about the virus. So in another publication, we wanted to try to test that directly, get more causal purchase on that. That's an association. We wanna see if we can get some causal clarity. So we're gonna run an experiment. And this is a, a, a public a piece of research that I have coming out in the Journal um, of Medical Internet Research with these colleagues at the medical school. Now, what we're showing you here is in the top row, we just asked people, who do you get news from about COVID? And in the bottom row, do you trust that news source? How much trust do you have in that news source? And what you can see is that Republicans, Democrats, independents, right, people are getting a lot of news about COVID from Trump and their governor, and then less so from healthcare providers, and maybe less so from the scientific sources too. But, they don't trust Trump as much on average and they're, they trust the science sources, they trust the healthcare sources. So the sources they trust are not the sources they're hearing from, especially in the beginning, in this first wave, which is in May. Okay, they're hearing from sources they don't trust as much. Um, and so we ran this experiment where we're gonna vary the messenger about vaccines. And so we're just gonna ask people if a safe and effective vaccine was made available, no cost, how likely would you be to get it? Um, assume it has mild side effects like stiffness and it's gonna protect you from getting COVID for a year and it's endorsed by, and then we put the name of an endorser in there. And one of those is gonna be Donald Trump. We varied the framing. Um, it'll protect you for a year, that's the personal frame. It will protect you and uh, will help protect others by not spreading the disease to people around you, that's a more social framing. That's gonna end up not making much of a difference. Okay, so the endorsers that we're gonna vary, spiritual and religious leader, Trump, Fauci and other scientific sources. Fauci is the US um, Director of National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. He's a, the spokesperson for COVID in the US. We're gonna combine those two to see what happens if they're both saying the same thing, then your personal physician, health insurance company, or local pharmacy. So here are the results. And um, the social and the personal are the gray and the black dots. There's not much difference there. So we pool them together in the blue dots. And as you can see, there's one condition that really has an effect on people saying whether they'd be willing to take a vaccine. And it's a drain. It's nearly a 10 point drain in uptake of the vaccine if Trump is the endorser. 
So on average in the US population, Trump endorsing the vaccine means less people on average are gonna take it. No other source was had a statistically significant move on uptake. When we combine Trump and Fauci, that negative effect is mitigated. And I'm gonna show you in the next slide that that's actually statistically significantly different from zero for some people. Oh, sorry, I took that slide out. So let me tell you in the interest of time who those people are. This negative effect for Trump is driven, not surprisingly, by Democrats and by women. Democrats and women are massively less likely, like 20 points less likely to say they will take the vaccine when Trump is the endorser. When Fauci joins Trump and it's endorsed by both of them, you can recoup about half of those losses for Democrats and for women. So it's very important to depoliticize the effects on this virus to have the scientific sources also um, talking about the disease or maybe having them talking the loudest about the disease. There's, we didn't do Biden this, we did it before the election. There's no reason to think that if this didn't say Biden, this effect would be similar, but would be driven by Republicans. So um, the, the importance of the scientific sources, I think, um, is the takeaway here. Okay, so last thing, and then we'll go to some questions. Can we associate COVID with people's decisions about vote in 2020? So this is complicated. We do not have panel data at this moment. So we don't know how people said they were gonna vote before COVID and then can compare to after COVID. But I do have all of these people over time. I wanna to try to leverage that to show you how these things are related. So I'm gonna model people's vote choice. Trump, Biden, July 2019 through election day. I'm going to make predictions based on this model that's gonna account for people's age, their race, their gender, their party identification, their ideology, liberal or conservative, how concerned they are about COVID, time, just where are we in the year, and then who they voted for in 2016. So the effects I'm gonna show you are gonna be net of all of these other things, taking all these things into account. And we're gonna look, we're gonna look for the effects of concern about COVID broken out by party. And I'm gonna do this for registered voters. Okay, so what do we see? What I'm showing you here is the, the effects the prediction of voting for Biden among people who are not concerned about COVID. Okay, broken out by party. This is Democrats, blue is Democrats, green are independents, red are Republicans, and um, the, this dash line is on average in the population. Okay, so these are the people who are not concerned about COVID. People who are concerned about COVID you can see all of these lines slope up, okay? Even among Republicans. Republicans who are concerned about COVID are more likely to vote for Joe Biden than those who are not concerned. They're still not that likely. You know, maybe they have a 31% chance of voting for uh, Biden, okay? Democrats, even Democrats who are concerned about the virus have more of a chance. They're all voting for him anyway, but they have a better chance if they're concerned. The real interesting line here, the one I've sort of bolded for you, is this green line. Look at how much steeper it is than the partisan lines. Partisans are partisans. The Republicans are not voting for Biden. The Democrats are voting for Biden at very, very high rates. But independents, okay, independents are very affected by their, I don't wanna say they're affected, their concern about COVID is highly associated with their vote choice. So people who say they're gonna vote for Biden are also people who are highly concerned about COVID and, and vice versa. It's the rate here that is interesting to me. So concern about COVID is associated with vote choice for these independents to more of a degree than it is for the partisans. Okay, how much more? A lot more. So what I'm showing you here is the same, this is the same data, the same model, 
but I'm just plotting for you the difference, the difference in the probability of voting for Biden, okay, by political party, Republicans, independents, and Democrats, due to being concerned or not about COVID. So Republicans, the difference was like a half, you know, it was like five, um, five uh, percentage points. Right? For independents, it's a lot more than that. And for Republicans, it's also about 10 points. So these independents are really, um, in some way, COVID is more associated with their decision. Now, it's worth pointing out that everything is gonna play a little more for independents. So if we put on here your ideology, it's gonna be more important for independents than Democrats or Republicans. Because again, remember that there's stability in vote choice for Republicans and Democrats because of that party ID. So these are the most volatile voters in the electorate. Everything moves them more, but not everything has to be a mover. And so that's, that's what I'm trying to show you here is that COVID is among the movers of these independents. Okay, and just as a, a, a check, I wanted to see what would happen with concern about COVID if the choice was not Biden versus Trump, but Sanders versus Pence. So we were asking people this question too for much of the survey. Who would you vote for if the contest was actually between Bernie Sanders and Mike Pence? And you can see here too, that concern about COVID for independents is associated with voting for Sanders. The effect is, is not as big here. The relationship is smaller and noisier because we don't have as many people um, who we've asked this question to, but it's, it's still there. So thinking about this, we wanna think about whether this is related to the messages that the two parties were sending to American voters um, about COVID, whether another possibility is these independents um, if we go back a slide, they've already decided they're gonna vote for Joe Biden. And they're just saying the thing Biden says about COVID, oh yeah, I'm worried. Okay, so we wanna be careful not to interpret this as causal. We don't really know which direction this is going, but I can tell you that I've been hammering away at this. This is what I've spent the last um, couple of weeks doing. And even if we only look for this effect in the first week after the virus comes out or the first two weeks after um, we know it's gonna, you know, it's it's really spreading in the U.S. So that's basically the last two weeks of March. We still see that concern is related. We don't even really know Biden's gonna be the nominee at that point. Um, we can see that concern is related to voting for Democrats. So a lot of that, I think, is about the rhetoric Trump is sending, not so much about the rhetoric that Biden will eventually send. And this is all to say that COVID is a huge missed opportunity for Trump in not trying to solve people's problems. We see that in these pictures, we see it in the way the governor's approvals are so much higher, the people who he basically handed the responsibility for solving people's problems over to. Okay, so to sum up, um, how does an unpopular twice impeached incumbent president lose but almost win? That's the question of 2020 um, in the US. And the answers that I have suggested and that I've been thinking about come in the, in the form of some things that Trump did that were missed opportunities um, and some things that could have helped him a little bit. So the policies that Republicans like just enacting those policies, that helps him because it shores up his base and, and really uh, creates enthusiasm among his base, but it's a missed opportunity because he's not expanding his electorate. The stimulus checks help to shore up what otherwise would have been a really bad economy for him coming into the election, but everyone's moving away from Trump a little bit in 2020 relative to 2016. They like their governors and local officials handling of COVID much more than Trump's handling of COVID. That's a missed opportunity. He handed that to those people. And then independence, and I didn't show you the effects for people who voted for third parties in 2016, but they look very similar. Independence and third party voters from 2016 show large differences um, coming in terms of vote choice based on their concern about COVID. 
And so this COVID concern is a player, a star player, if you will, um, in the 2020 election and uh, is not helping Donald Trump. And so I'm going to leave it there and uh, turn it back to Peter and we can do some questions. Lynn, thanks very, very much for that. Uh, I'd encourage people who want to pose questions to put them into the, the Q&A function. I'll kind of compile them and, and, and read them out. Um, I've got, I got many to start off with, Lynn, so I'll, I'll, I'll kick things off. Sure. So um, let's, let's start near the beginning. And, and you showed us a, a plot, which really is a story about where Trump's policies are vis-a-vis -vis what, the, what the public wants. And um, what I wonder is, is whether there's any Republican president, given the Republican Senate and given the unique contours of the House, who would have been able to pursue those policies in that upper right quadrant. And that's the quadrant where policy is popular with Republicans, but yeah. also popular with, with all Americans. School choice is one that's on there that maybe they, they could have pulled off. And the fact that he didn't pursue that is... Uh, is an interesting question as to why that didn't why that didn't happen. Um, parental leave that would require a different Republican Party than, than than is there now. So I asked this question not not only to look back but to kind of look forward, right? So is there is there a bundle of policies that, that Donald Trump could have effectively pursued, or that some other Republican could have been successful in pursuing? And is that the same bundle that some Republican who wants to try to moderate the party should be pursuing now? Okay, so two, two two separate questions there, and and the first the answer to the first one I think, you know I think is a definite yes. Um, I I did not show you a bunch of evidence that we have from Nationscape about the priorities that people place on these issues. So that picture that I showed is only about how many people want those things. People want a lot of things. Some of them are very important to people. And some of them, people don't really take it or leave it. Like, it'd be great if we had this, but it, it, I got 10 other things that I want more. So as part of Nationscape, we conducted um, an experiment that has many millions of iterations in it. We asked people to play a game. Um, it's not a game, but it's sort of like a game. And everyone does it 10 times, where we show them a set of issues, uh, packages. We say package A or package B. And you have to choose which world you'd rather live in, world A or world B. And we populate these things randomly. And um, by looking at what people choose, we're able to see which issues are the most important to people. So when you know cutting taxes on middle, uh, middle income families is in the choice set, oh, you know, Republicans always choose that. So that's a high priority for them. They'll sacrifice other things to, that they want to get that. Okay, so when we do that, what we see is that a lot of those things that were in the upper right quadrant, everyone wants, popular with everyone, including Republicans, are not high priorities for Republicans. So here are some examples. I mentioned universal gun background checks. Everybody wants universal background checks, overwhelmingly popular in the United States. It is a high priority for Democrats and independents, but not a high priority for Republicans. They want it, but they want other things more. Same thing with $15 minimum wage, something that Joe Biden just acted on last in the last couple of days. Everybody wants the $15 minimum wage in the United States. It's an, a pretty high impact issue for Democrats and independents. Not, it's not super high, but it is not high at all for Republicans. But everybody agrees on it. So the real test, I think, is getting the right politician, and you asked the question about Republicans, so getting the right Republican who's a, a bit of a political entrepreneur, a good communicator, who can come in and point out to Republican colleagues in the House and Senate, hey, your constituents want these things. They want other things more. They don't think these things are necessarily a top 10 priority item, but they do want them. And if you can go into your constituency and increase the importance of these things, and then you can come along and deliver them, that's a win for you. So these, these popular things can be wins for voters and for politicians if those politicians are willing to do a little bit of work 
to create the importance in the electorate of these things. And I don't think that's impossible. I just think it requires effort and, and some skill. Um, you know, I, it, it is true that it doesn't happen. So, you know, yes. maybe, you know, reality is, is the proof, but, but then I just like sort of say back, if we limited the things we tried to achieve by what we actually saw happening, we'd never make progress on anything. Yes. So, yes. you know, we, this is, I think this is worth a shot. Yeah. So this is very interesting, Lynn. I mean, I, I think that one of the mysteries of, of Trump is that we'll look back and, and we may ask a couple of things. One is why didn't he see the opportunities he had? I'll, I'll, I'll articulate that in a second. And why was he punished so much for what he, for what he did on the first point, you know, <laughs> We no one really knew what Trump stood for when he was elected. We've got a forthcoming piece in the JLP that shows that uncertainty around his ideological position is greater than any presidential candidate ever. So he could have gone in and said, I believe I was elected to bring in a massive infrastructure program to increase the minimum wage to 15%, to reshore American jobs, and, and to actually have this kind, of blue, this kind of blue Democrat yeah. thing, right? Which, which he which, talked about during the which campaign. He, which he talked about, but didn't have the political wherewithal or, or, or the policy sophistication to bring forward. Right. So the question is, I mean, what would have happened if he'd done that in some sense? Right. But the other mystery to me, and I'd love to hear your reflections on this, is that it's not only a story about governors, but it's a story about governments around the whole world being rewarded during COVID. People see that governments yes. care about issues they care about. Everyone sees by the same issue. They're they're doing, if not their best, they're trying hard to deal with these with these issues. And they're speaking directly to voters about it. So governments are more likely to be reelected re than not around the world on, on COVID right now. It's been our experience in Canada, but it's been mm -hmm. the experience other places. And it's the experience of a lot of these governors that they've been rewarded for taking proactive action against, or at least action against COVID. And yet for the president, for the former president, he was not able to turn that into a moment where he appeared to be a wartime leader. You're, you're a very close observer of politics. What's your, what's your sense of why he wasn't able, or what, what's this, the wealth of reasons for why he wasn't able to yeah. take that crisis and turn it into a defining event for him in a positive way? I think that, um, I think I understand it, but it is, it's a lot of different threads coming together. The first I think is that um, he, you know, Trump is not a politician. And so one of the things I think he never appreciated was that he loves, he loves applause. He loves adulation, but he didn't quite ever, he doesn't quite get that it isn't how loud the applause are. It's how many people are clapping. So he just, he just wants the loudness of the applause. And that's, I think what explains the focus on the people who are easy targets who are always going to like him. Um, politicians understand that they have to promote the public good and that that's how more people are going to applaud them. And that's good for votes. So I think him just not being a politician, he's inclined differently to think about that feedback that he wants. Um, I think in the very beginning, I thought like on March 13th, 14th, he's, he's making these speeches, declaring a you know, state of emergency, um, saying that the parking lots of drugstores and big stores like Walmart and Target in the United States were gonna be transformed into testing sites and this private public partnership. And I thought to myself like, wow, this is, these ideas are fantastic. And, and is this really gonna, are we really gonna see the CEOs of these major companies come together with politicians to solve this problem for Americans? It'd be amazing. Of course, none of that happened. And the, I think it's not that he doesn't see the opportunity, but it's that what immediately starts to happen is how, how long are the stores going to be closed? How long are people going to be out of work? The economy is taking a hit. And that, I think, in, it's instinct for him to think about the bottom line, because again, not a politician, a business person, but also he's got all of these consultants reminding him, you know, political scientists have done a great job of communicating to politicians that the state of the economy is a driver of election outcomes. Um, when Sides and I started writing these books in, in 2012, you know, people didn't talk about that as much. But now with 
all of the explainer journalism and the data-driven journalism out there, everybody, everybody knows this like it's a regular thing, uh, which is good because it is a regular thing. But so he's got all of these people saying, you know, the economy, the economy, the economy, you had a booming economy and now it's shrinking. You've got to, you have to revert, reverse that. And I think again, because of how he thinks about things, he isn't sort of a vision guy. He's uh, an immediate tactical guy. So what's the fastest way to get the economy, just open it back up. Instead of the vision leadership idea would have been, let's, let's get the virus under control and open and the economy can reopen. So I think it's all of those things kind of coming together. Um, I don't think it's that he didn't see the opportunities. I think it's that he's focused on, on other problems and then wants to solve them quickly. I, let's can we switch to COVID just a little bit. I think that's a great description yeah. of the president and it's a, it's a very, it's a very compelling account. So, uh, what is what is remarkable about the American case is, I think, is the degree to which COVID concern is structured by partisanship and to which behavioral responses seem to be structured by partisanship. And what I do want to emphasize, which is which it's something you emphasized in there, is that the overwhelming majority of Americans are concerned about COVID and are taking the common sense measures necessary to combat it in their everyday lives. They're washing their hands and they're socially distancing and they're wearing masks when they go into stores. And you know, we can focus on the the yahoos here and there who insist that they have a right to cough on people or whatever, whatever the argument is. But for the most part, people are complying. And yet there are differences there between people. Can you give us a sense? And, and this is one of the questions in, in the chat, actually, how much of this is about the social expression of partisanship that when you're talking to people about it, they're saying, I don't do that stuff, I'm not worried, but in fact, maybe they do. And how much of it is actually, and it's some, it's surely some mix, but how much of it is actually people who are really cueing their behaviors based on what their politicians are, are, uh, are telling them for me, the vaccine results are very stark one that, you know, mm -hmm. one person out of 10 less would, would be less likely to take the vaccine because despite being approved by the FDA, Donald Trump had, had, had endorsed it. Can you walk us through sort of what this tells us about the, the, the depth of partisanship in the U S yeah, I, I wish I could um I, I i don't i don't have a great way to get purchase on that surely some of it is partisan cheerleading um and and we saw this a little bit when uh kamala harris i can't remember exactly when she said this but they asked about you know will you get a vaccine this was before the election outcome and, she, and after she's named as the vice presidential running mate, um, but before the outcome, and she says, well, not if Donald Trump tells me to get it. And then she had to walk that back um, and did so pretty quickly within a day. Yes. And yes. you know, her initial response was to be partisan about it. And then once you know, people said to her like, uh, you know, if the FDA approves it and it's out there, um, we really do need more than half the population to go get it. So you know, it wasn't yeah. a great message you just said. And so she clarified. Yes. Um, and, and as you said, like our experimental evidence on the messaging is, is probably the best um, evidence that we have on this. I, I, I cut that table out, but I neglected to say that about 65 to 68% to of the population on average in the US said they would take that vaccine as we described it, approved by the FDA in the fast track process, very few side effects, free, easily available. That's ended up being a problem. But um, 68, 70%, like that's a lot, but according to all of the science, not enough. Um, you mm -hmm. really need that number to be higher. And so, the fact that there's another paper that some some other folks um, in a medical school did where they it's a little different setup, but they did Biden and Trump. They get the same depressed effect when Biden is the endorser among mm -hmm. Republicans that we got among Democrats for Trump. So maybe that gives us some sense that some of it is partisan cheerleading. The part I don't it's, I mean, it's definitely a partisan effect. The part I don't know how to sort out with this particular question is whether that's just, uh, you know, 
cheerleading or whether it really means those people aren't going to go get a vaccine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and even if it's cheerleading, right, saying I'm not going to get a vaccine if the, if the president tells me to do it, it's pretty, it's pretty bold, right? I mean, it's a, it's a lifesaver, right? So you might want, you might want to give it a shot. Let, let me yeah. ask you one, one, one question to to wrap up here, and there are reflections of this in the in the in, in the Q and A. I'll just preface it by saying that, um, you know, normally uh, elections serve as a kind of a pressure relief valve. You know, the day after the election, everybody takes a deep breath, and you realize, <laughs> okay, it's done. All the all the arguing and the rancor and the to and the fro is over for at least two more years. But not this time. Um, this time, the election night was really just just kicked off a sustained period of conflict for several weeks that culminated with a pretty unbelievable, you know, um, raiding of the of the US, the US Congress first time it's been overrun since the Canadians did it in 1812. So uh, which were you burned Toronto first, so it's. It, but anyways, we won't go. Into that. <laughs> but but it really was, you know, a ramping up of conflict and not a and not a uh, a reduction of it. Um, do you do you have a sense as a really keen observer of this of how we can kind of walk back the 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 rancor that's existing not between politicians but between ordinary people and and how does how do you walk back from from this this heated an argument to return to a time when people can hopefully have more constructive conversations about politics. Yeah, I think I would say two things about this. The first is that when we think about the United States, a lot of people are not voting in presidential elections. They are not interested in politics. It is not something that motivates any part of their day or thought process. So the first thing is a little bit to get out of our bubbles where um, you know the the cable news is on all the time or the the New York Times homepage is open on the at the screen all the time and, and you're refreshing to see what's going on in the world. A lot of people are not oriented that way. So the first thing is not to make too much of the fact that this is um, some sort of rip in the fabric of society that we need to mend. It is definitely a rip in one segment of society. So that that was, is thing one, that um, that there are, there are just lots and lots of people out there for whom this is not a problem. But among the set of people for whom it is a problem, I think that um, elite leadership is very important. So we need to see leadership from both political parties that comes together to solve problems. And that is not a fantasy. People, people tell me all the time that that's, you know, I'm living in some kind of dream world and I don't believe it. Um, we've talked a lot in the last half hour about a set of things, important policy outcomes on which all Americans overwhelmingly agree. I left out the overwhelmingly part before. It's not that they just kind of agree, there's overwhelming desire for universal gun background checks in this country um, and, and some other things like that. And if politicians can convince voters that those are important things, the things that they actually want, those are important things to work on and they can do it together, they can help people move to a conversation that centers more around the way we're improving our lives by focusing on things we all want than the way that we're stalled because we're only focusing on the things that everyone disagrees on. Um, and I do think there's a pathway there for an entrepreneurial politician. Um, I haven't seen one yet, but um, you know, hope springs eternal. Then uh, we can have everything in life, but more time. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much for the, for, for the time you've spent with us. Um, when uh, when travel returns sometime in the next three years, we will have you up to uh, up to Toronto. But in the meantime, I encourage everybody to to buy Lynn's uh, uh, book that will come out on this, to to read her in the upshot, and to uh, keep track of her insights on politics. Thanks very much for your for your time with us. Thank you. Uh, thanks and thanks so much everyone for, for joining us this afternoon.